Hello and welcome once again to Baked Beans Garage, where we don't need brakes, they only slow you down. So last episode, I took apart that D24T over there and said I was going to try to find some parts. I have found some parts, but they are coming from Lithuania. So this week, we'll not be putting that engine back together, but I will be, you know, making the brakes work and whatnot. Whatnot being taking the HVAC box out, taking the dash out, doing a bunch of little odd jobs. So it's going to be all over the place, I do warn you as will be the rest of the series, but hey, it's gonna be shinier. Let's get into it. To begin, I have done some housekeeping in here since last time. Sealed that up with some primer on this side and that side, gave it a nice clean. I'm gonna start with getting the dash out because I need to get the HVAC box out so I can paint this real nice and good with no tape lines and anything of the sort. I also need to get the booster and master out, so getting the dash out will make that a little easier because a booster and a master cylinder are both gettable, as is an evaporator and a heater core, so I'm going to be doing that. And since I only have the old Haynes manual, I'm going to be guessing for most of this, because this is no help. Uh, I'm just going to take some screws out, maybe. With that out of the way, I went ahead and pulled all the electrical plumbing out of the engine bay with the extractor there. Only three big harnesses. I like to see it when all the systems are separated into different harnesses, but here the middle one has all the HVAC stuff and the vacuum lines, but also the left side headlights. The right side headlights are bundled in here with the glow plugs and all the engine instrumentation. And uh, then there's just one more with a bunch of random stuff on it. Uh, this I will go over in a future episode. Pretty much on all these 80s rigs, you got to completely go through these because all the seals in here and the blending doors just turn into nothing. Uh, these vacuum motors go bad and we'll also have to replace that warmer and the coldener over there. Uh, back to the engine bay, I'm going to start with getting all these hard lines out and then pull the master and the booster. Uh, we'll make room for the new pieces. Also the new paint, just cheapo summit paint I've used in the past. Said brakes, as you may have noticed, are all doubled up. Now split systems were already commonplace in the 80s, but they went even further on this. We could see out of the master, the rear piston and the front piston, both two lines come out of it. Uh, the front drinker side is driven off both separate circuits. The other circuit goes down to the distributor valve and we've got two more lines that go into the captain side and then two more that go down to the aft end and on each front caliper is two pistons and two hoses and two bleeders all the redundancy in the world now this is just on standard brake cars i guess abs cars had one big pot i don't know how that works anyways gonna take some more things out of there and start getting ready for Ever so close not till the last two but we did get into that spicy rust belt sadness but they were persuaded in the end anyway time to rattle cam that cross member and then not rattle cam <laughs> Could have gone a little better. Uh, I hit the air valve at the bottom of the gun. It shut the air off and I got some grips. Uh, but I do argue that in order to be a terrible painter, I would in the first place have to be a painter. 
So I argue that I'm not a terrible painter. But yeah, after this bricks up a little more, we'll get in there with the deep nipper and make that a little prettier. It might just be what it is, but who cares? Anyway, I will demask the satisfying part and then I'll get into uh, these crusty old stoppers. So upon first glance, these crusty stoppers don't look that great, but in reality, they're actually only a little bit worse than that. Uh, first item of interest, we could see the tube welded into the strut tube. Uh, apparently this is the accepted way to lift these cars, although Mr. Magoo's blind apprentice seems to have uh, gone at the hot metal glue gun on this one. We'll get into that later. The first order of business is going to be this less than ideal wheel spacer off. Obviously this had XJ Cherokee wheels on it and Volvo being Volvo. Everything's 5x108 so these are adapted to 5x4.5? I don't know. I'm curious to see, because I already know these aren't hub centric to the wheel, I'm curious to see if it is hub centric to the hub. Awful shiny for an impact socket, don't you think? Let's find out. So that's a plastic hub centric ring, so yes at one point in time it was hub centric, but uh, these brakes seem to have gotten pretty hot because that is no longer hub centric. I don't know what I'm going to do about this whole mess yet, but uh, something better has to be figured out. Uh, you can go ahead and fight me in the comments. I don't care if you're using conical uh, lug nuts, which pretty much all cars do. They do not center the wheel on the hub. You need a hub centric ring. If you're relying just on the studs to both center the wheel and hold it on, that's how you lose a wheel. We'd like to avoid that, especially being quite large wheels. Anyways, I'm going to stop talking and uh, take the rest of this apart. Making sure to do this in the proper wrong order, I uh, made that bolt nice, perfectly machine round, but I have these cool flower power sockets that uh, I've never had a good experience with, but might as well try them now. If I even have the... Oh. was fairly convincing. Oh! Well, hello! Didn't really expect that, but you saw it work. I don't think this will be going back on. It's already quite perforated, even more of that Swiss cheese action. Uh, plus, this originally had 14s on it. It's going to have 15s, so it's not really going to do anything anyway. Now you always want to make sure to do everything in the complete wrong order the first time, then get used to it on the second side. Uh, I'm sure the Haynes manual even would have helped with that, but I can't read. So all that's left to do under here is we'll get off the rest of this undercoat, which is crusty underneath, and we'll rework this here loving clearancing down on the rocker. We'll make it fit with the fender real nice. Up over here we have all of our old crust. Uh, if you don't have any flats on your inner tie rods of pipe wrenches, your friend, or if they're just stuck on there real good, left the ball joints on the control arms because I got new ones. Uh, the struts, many problems here. We can see our booger welds. We can see up there the upper spring perch really isn't doing its job. It's even rubbing on the shaft. So I'm going to get these apart, clean up those welds, and see what I can save. I'll uh, get them bushings pressed out, clean up the strut rods, clean up a bunch of stuff, and then start painting. The uh, dust shields I'm not going to be able to delete because the wheel seal is built into them. I don't know what I'll do there yet, but quite a bit of holes. These we can see are the early style uh, girling calipers. I have the new ones, they are the later style, the webbing's just a little different, but they're the same calipers. Uh, you want to make sure 
you know what calipers you're buying before you buy them because I, I made a little mistake. These are the Bendix calipers that I bought the first time. Oh well, it'll stop. So yeah, here's all our shiny new stuff. I'm just gonna paint all the bare cast iron stuff to keep it looking pretty and then just throw all that back on the car. Now it's entirely possible that there is actually a proper tool for this, but that sounds like it costs money, so I didn't even bother looking. This is what I usually do. Just make sure it's not pointed at anything important and zip it off. Now normally when I do this, I don't have to worry about getting it back on because I'm lowering it and I'm just using the upper mounts. But as that one popped, I realized I'm going to have to get these back on in a semi-civilized manner. We'll get to that. So for the uninitiated, these Volvos use a cartridge type strut like Zoe, what slides down into this tube and is retained by this nut at the top. I've never taken one of these off before and as crusty as this looks, I'm guessing it's not going to be a lot of fun at all. So I'm just going to hit her with some of God's tears, maybe some heat later. We'll let that chew. Uh, in the meantime, we'll talk about this hoopty lift kit. Well, it's actually not that bad. Uh, usually this tube sits quite a lot up higher than the uh, spring perch here. Someone's just welded more tube in and moved that way up, which the wells actually aren't that bad. Just a little boogery. I'll see what I can clean up. Get right after this with my comically oversized channel locks and uh, hope no shot. Well, I broke that. I broke that. That's what it took to get off. Miserable. I done drilled a hole in both of them. What for not making an explosion welding on it, but I think I'm just gonna jump straight into that method on this one. Mmm, hateful. Now, as we all know, three lefts don't make a wrong, but three of the wrong tools usually get you close enough to where you need to be. So here I have a cobbled mess of random sockets and discs and whatnot. I'm gonna replace these bushings and the strut rods before I get to painting stuff. Uh, usually I try to avoid Euro parts, but sometimes they're the only option and they're better than nothing. Anyway, let's see if this works. Now I don't have anything that'll accept that shape on the end to be able to press the new one in, so I'm just gonna mutilate this old one here enough to make myself a tool. I think everyone knows this trick by now. Uh, except me, apparently. It's not that broken.
Easy. I put the tripod right in the way of the jack handle. That was good foresight. I am normally this incompetent. I'm not just doing this for show. There we go. Beautiful. Now before I begin the Jackson Pollock action, a few words about making the paint stay on the parts. First off, after you knock off the big chunks of rust and the real wet grease, you want to scuff it, abrade it in some manner. Obviously a blasting cabinet with an abrasive blast would be ideal if you can afford a cabinet, Mr. Rockefeller. Otherwise, 220 grit is usually good enough, maybe a little rougher for some uh, parts that are going to be subjected to real adverse conditions. Uh, Second, remember that heat is paint's best friend. So when you paint your parts, you want to give her a few passes with the, the torch there. That not only burns off any oils or greases that might be left on the surface, that'll also open the pores and suck the paint in real good. Maybe even warm up your paint can a little bit. That really helps. Not too hot. You don't want it to flash off as soon as it hits the surface. That's no good. Just warm to the touch, not burning. And furthermore, for these undercar parts, I find this uh, wheel paint works best if you're going the rattle can option. Of course, that's all I can afford. Uh, I'm also going to give all these new cast iron parts a quick lick just so they stay pretty. Obviously, these will uh, oxidize on the surface, but they won't actually corrode, being a quality of cast iron. Uh, also, while I have them out here, always label which spring is which, because you never know, your car might have two different rate springs in the front. Uh, this one I painted the ends white because that rhymes with right so I know it's the right spring and this one I marked red Because that starts with an R and so does right so I know that's the right spring Anyway, well, let's get into it So we got a bunch of parts, Craigslist rebuilt and ready to go back on the car. Uh, a few words about these here, these upper spring perches. As far as I can tell, the only way that would have come dislocated, as you saw earlier, was during assembly. So I used some windshield urethane to stick that back on real nice and tight. So uh, hopefully it won't happen again in the future. The benefactor said, do not paint anything blue or green, so I painted those blue for him. Uh, side note, that caliper paint that I used on those guys does not cure fully until it's heat cycled a couple times, so be careful with them until you put them on, then it'll be good later. Ah, furthermore, I've been cleaning up in here, getting ready to, psh, to make it look pretty, and I found some more rust I'm gonna have to fix first. Ah! Those episodes were supposed to be done. Anyways, only thing I have left to paint is the brake booster. If you're buying one of these from Rock Auto, from you know some remanufacturer like Cardone, this one is, they come with this gray stuff, I don't know, but you gotta use some acetone or brake clean to wipe that off before you can paint it. And that's gonna be gloss black, cause the uh, that's how it would have been from the factory. And we're all about factory accuracy here. Now glossing over a not very delicious incident, all of the hyper-focusing and painting everything forever is about done and I can start putting some bolts in. The only real item of interest being these uh, scupper rings, I guess, for the wheel seals because they have these goofy non-regular wheel seals. I don't know what to call them. I cut out the brake shield that was all Swiss cheese to keep these. Uh, everything else is painted. I gotta put the struts together. I already got that guy in there with plenty of the uh, silver anti-seize. So I just gotta slide this guy in here. 
Now you want to be careful with these. These are some super fine threads on these nuts up here. And that holds all of the weight of the spring when it's pushing back up when you get them together. So take your time, be careful. And here's an example of what happens when you don't get all of that gray goop off, just fish eyes for days. That's no good. Uh, now to get the springs on, I have chosen bodily injury, but at least when it explodes in or around my face, it'll be on film for you to enjoy. So I'll get all of the holdy any bits back in the car, and then I'll focus on the hubs and bearings over there, and then throw some brakes on it. Now back here on the car, I'm gonna yak about tie rods for a bit. Hey, did you know that 740s use two different size of inner tie rods? There's a 16 millimeter flavor and there's an 18. The new ones I bought are 16s, but I wanna put the car back on the ground, so I'm just gonna use the old ones for now while I wait for the, the new ones I ordered last night in a panic. Now, these don't have a locking plate or any kind of safety device, so I'll use a little drop of red Loctite. You don't need much when I thread that guy in there but since this will be temporary, I won't bother. And of course, you're gonna wanna use your old one to get the length roughly right. I don't care, because everything's gonna get aligned later anyway. Now to get the boot on without causing a headache for yourself, you're gonna to wanna to use some more of that silicone grease. This I found at the old extortion auto down in town there. And you're gonna to wanna to slather this all about. Don't demonetize me for this. And this will not only help you get it on without tearing it, you especially want some grease right here because when you go later to adjust it, if this is a clean, dry surface, you're just going to twist your boot all around while you try to move this. And that is a headache, believe you me. And I have the rack yanked all the way this way just for ease of access. We'll go ahead and push that back, spit a bunch of juice out there. Ooh, there she is. And like I said, the rack is in decent shape and actually not leaking at all. And I'm not going to touch it. I don't have a zip tie for the other side, but you get the idea. And now on to the spinny aroundy bits what hold the wheels on. I did go back and tighten all those bolts over there, but that's not very fun to watch, so I didn't film it. Anyways, here's one I had done. I knocked the bearing races out and licked all the grease out, so this is what we're starting with. This one I have yet to do. Now, there are special tools for this, some of which I even have, most of which I don't. Uh, these bearing races are uh, interference fit, but they do just tap out with a punch and a hammer. Uh, same with the wheel studs, much easier to do it off of the car. The bearings that came out of it, we can see this grease is very runny, and it's not really grease anymore, and that's how they go bad. On the outer race here, we could see lots of scoring in the very beginning of some bluing. Uh, this loses its lubricity and its cooling ability, and that's what you get eventually. That would have turned into nothing but glitter. Anyways, we got some new Tims and Kens right here, uh, and some new wheel studs. I even have the right tools to knock the new bearing races in, so that'll be nice. Uh, to knock them out, I do not. Uh, pin punches aren't the right tool, but they'll work.
And here I got the wheel seal ring thingy back on. You can see where I have removed some material as that's pretty hammered. Uh, so I'll start with the little, what's it called, this wheel seal. Egg is on first. Never put on a seal dry. That's how you eat them up. Now, everyone seems to have a different opinion on uh, how to torque in your spindle nuts here. You may or may not like this, depending on your definition of the word correct. But to make sure your bearings are seated real nice and good, give, give her a solid crank. Mm. You gotta be smarter than your croissant wrench here. Back it off. Give her a spin. Give her another crank. And once you're happy with that, you just tighten it until there's ever so slightly a little bit of drag on there. Too tight and you'll burn them up too loose and your wheel will be all floppy. Neither of which are ideal. And slam in the old cotter pin. And there we are. All the bolts are back in. Most of them are even tightened down. I guess I'll find out when I go to drive it. I got the old Sapuku spec wheel adapters back on here because the Jeep wheels are all I have to throw on it. And I need to roll her outside to play some automotive musical chairs because I am too broke at the moment to fix the uh, bratwurst flavored Hachiroku over there. Uh, something else will be there next time. If you know what this wrench is for, that's actually a hint. Anyway, she's pretty shiny. We'll uh, clean up them drips at a future date. Pretty upset about those. Speaking of future dates, I'll also be addressing all of the breaks later. This has already been quite the long episode and I need to go take two naps. So that'll do it for this installment of the series. If you've made it this far in the episode, I do appreciate you. Uh, a few new things have showed up on my front porch, such as the correct inner tie rods, as well as some gaskets from Lithuania. So progress should accelerate a bit over the coming months. If life would quit getting in the way, I would appreciate that. Uh, anyway, this is Baked Beans Garage. I am Chinchilla. I do appreciate you watching. Please do leave a like, maybe even subscribe if you do feel so inclined. I'd love to be doing this full time. Aren't pipe dreams nice? Anyway, I'll see you next time.